And um, so welcome. And we're just thrilled to be at Stitches. And um, so if you can't be with us live, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll come and you're watching the recording of this. But um, I am Amy Swanson. I am the director of June Pad here. And we're coming to you from our dining room in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And that is where the headquarters for the RP team is. However, our story takes us to Kyrgyzstan. And I'll be telling you, showing you some slides and telling you about that in the first portion. And I'm just going to run this for the continuous hour. So again, if you're popping in and out, um, we will put the recording up so you can come back in and watch uh, sections that you can see. Um, we do have a discount, 10% discount off our site. The code is stitches61. The page that you're linked to on the event is the event page. So it takes you to a um, event exclusive page for the discount and for that's where I'll be putting up the recording and um, and then you can there's some featured items there and then you of course are linked to the whole website to uh, to order and see the other things there um, the tech person with us is my husband who graciously does this part for me every time and his name is Ron Sylvester so thank you or if, if you're a fan of disembodied voices Carlton the doorman oh I don't know the reference um kind you're not you're old enough for that mary tyler moore show oh okay <laughs> i don't i don't remember that all right <laughs> um and then um i'm thankful that my sister joins um every time and she's in kitchener ontario canada and uh well it's been way over a year and a half since we've seen each other live but i think we're getting closer and closer to being able to see each other so we're thankful for these kinds of um technological abilities zoom or facetime or whatever so but she hit so many of our samples that she joins and, and tells about uh, construction of pieces and exactly you know her own experience with the music art so i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to turn to a powerpoint and uh give you a little introduction to what our company is all about and why we exist so I'll we'll feature the PowerPoint and trade uh, we'll trade places with uh, my husband. Who is a little slow on the uptake. Ready. In uh, presentation mode, perfect. Um, so uh, we like to say that at June Courage Mayor that it's more than yarn because it absolutely is. Intertwined in each skein of our yarn, is a, a shepherd family living in Kurdistan. So um, Kurdistan, if you don't know, sits on the ancient Silk Road routes. Um, one of the routes went through um, Southern Kurdistan. And you can see with the red lines here that um, what those ancient uh, trade routes were like. And uh, I'll take my arrow, you can see the arrow when I do it. Um, to the north is Russia, to the east is China. Kyrgyzstan sits here, landlocked. Um, whoops, I want to go back. Yeah, go back. Um, it is landlocked. It is the, the, if you can see the relief here, it is very mountainous. Right through where the uh, road went is a valley that on either side sits uh, mountains. Uh, so the mountains in the valley run east west. And that trade route was, you know, one of the major connections east to west. And where we're working with shepherds currently is exactly that region. Um, Kurdistan was once part of the Soviet Union for about 100 years, starting in the late 1900s until 1991. And that impacts um, the history here and the current uh, situation and why Kurdistan uh, needs economic development, which is why then we exist. So uh, the shepherds have always been, um, for centuries and centuries, um, um, nomadic. When they lived in the um, under Soviet um, infrastructure, they became semi-nomadic, and I'll show that in a in a second here. But by nomadic, they go into the mountains, and they now they stay uh, for the summer months. Well, really, spring until fall. And they take their animals and they graze, and they actually live in yurts. And uh, the yurts are just beautifully made. The, the walls and the ceilings and the floors are all textiles. Textiles have made up um, 
sort of the heartbeat of these people's um, forever. And so they make the walls. The walls last about 10 years or all of that felted fabric. Um, that is felted from the wool from their sheep. And that is repellent to rain and weather. And again, lasts them about 10 years before they need new walls and new ceilings and new floors. The beautiful tapestries there um, are uh, made by the shepherd women during um, the winter months usually. Um, so this is their living in those uh, spring to fall months when some of the shepherd families go up the mountains and uh, live with the animals. So semi-nomadic today, because during the Soviet times, uh, villages were formed, collective farms uh, with the shepherds. Shepherds were encouraged to organize and live in villages and come away from their traditional living of, um, of um, being nomadic. And so this is that valley, that valley that uh, runs east and west. Um, those are the mountain ranges, and the mountain ranges sit at about 20,000 feet, and the valley at about 14,000. And then this is one of the families we work with. Um, and um, I have not yet been to Kyrgyzstan, so uh, was looking, putting that on my calendar. Of course, we have had COVID, so that is on pause, but I can't wait to go. The hospitality, I'm told, is just um, beyond belief by these um, beautiful people. And they are agricultural in their lifestyle if they stay in the valley. And, um, uh, potatoes is one of their main crops. So during those Soviet times, uh, this textile producing region produced um, with the shepherds living in collectivized uh, farms in the valleys, they had an outlet to mills. So there were all of these mills that employed literally thousands of people and they produced cotton and wool and um, um, cotton wool and oh, silk, yes. And then with, by being part of the larger Soviet Union, they had outlet to market access. So it was this, um, you know, well-oiled machine that worked for the economy. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, um, these factories were shut down and um, everything collapsed almost overnight. These factories were sold. A few people made money off of um, the equipment and really became quite wealthy. Uh, of course, then the people who worked there lost all their jobs. So today, since 1991 to today, this is the mills, this is what the mills are now. So they lay in ruin. Entities such as the World Bank have um, looked to try to build the economy back for Kurdistan since 1991, always trying to look toward their resources, including their textile resources. Um, without mills, wool is impossible to try to um, export and sell because wool just does not bring enough income back um, to even cover the expense of exporting for processing. Um, enter June Kashmir in about 2008. So this is the founder of June Kashmir. He's from Columbus, Ohio originally. He has uh, economic development in his blood and that is what he wanted to do. So he was in Kurdistan at the time trying to um, establish um, mini mills with, an, with another fellow um, who had a mini mill here in the US and thinking that these mini mills were a way to try to bring build, mills back to um, the, the, throughout the whole region. That endeavor fell apart. But at the same time, this um, research center was hired and in, in particular, the woman in the left there in the middle, Carol Kirvin, is a social anthropologist and she was hired to look at the goats that were isolated in that valley that I'm talking about. Um, and she was hired to do that because um, that was the native goat of Kurdistan. And remember that we sit uh, to the, just to the west of China and Mongolia where the finest cashmere in the world is produced. And what they wanted to know was, do these goats produce cashmere and what is its quality? And uh, what she found was that these native goats um, had the potential to produce cashmere as, um, as good as the cashmere that was coming out of, you know, the best cashmere coming out of um, China and Mongolia. So they had good, these goats had good cashmere, but they needed to have some attention. So farmers needed some help on um, knowing best um, 
husbandry practices and best fiber collection practices. And um, of course, um, if you have read at all about cashmere production in uh, recent times, um, we've been concerned about cashmere production and its sustainability and its um, ethics. And so what Sai found was that he could turn his economic endeavors toward cashmere. Cashmere would have enough value that it could be milled outside the country and then be a way to sort of help the country um, give shepherds direct income and um, help build the economic infrastructure of Kyrgyzstan. So that is what he did. He transitioned to June cashmere and working with the goats. Now, why it's significant that these goats are uh, just sort of discovered in 2008 in this region is because those very high mountains uh, isolated the goats from the rest of Kyrgyzstan. That is important because of being under Soviet rule, the Soviets did not value cashmere as a fiber. So they did a lot of crossbreeding with the goats, the native goats, these goats in the rest of Kyrgyzstan um, with either the an Angora goat or the uh, Russian Don goat, which is a larger goat, because their, their purposes for goats were really um, meat products and dairy products. And so finding these goats not having been crossbred in this southern region um, was very exciting and one of the first ways that really, I mean, think about that since 1991 to 2008, um, that there was a potential to, to drive economic development and, and help to drive um, sort of bringing back textiles to this um, region. So Sai set up June Kashmir with, um, some, uh, with a local infrastructure and um, worked with um, uh, the shepherds to train on best husband breed and uh, collection practices. Now, you can see the outer coat on these goats is very long and, and rough looking. Um, that is not cashmere. Cashmere is only the downy undercoat that grows for um, warmth for the winter months. So because it's such a high altitude for living, these goats uh, need that extra warmth. The, uh, that downy undercoat naturally molts off for the spring and then that is what is collected. A goat only produces about four ounces a year. We work with about in this region, southern region, about um, 1,200 families in about 200 villages. On average, a family owns 10 goats and it is the cheapest animal for a family to own. So it helps the poorest people um, have a spring bonus income. Um, certainly this can't be their only living, but this is giving an income that I'll talk about in a little bit at a very a kind of crucial time in the year. So uh, there are cream color goats and there are dark black looking goats and there are kind of brown in between, but there is never black cashmere. So that downy undercoat never reaches that deep black pigment. Um, you get kind of a grayish and a mid brown and a cream, but, but interestingly you never get that black. Now this is what the goats look like where they've been crossbred in the rest of the country. And uh, so you can see how the coat is very different you know, kind of consistent throughout. Whereas here, um, that very long coat is the outer coat and then the downy undercoat that um, naturally molts off, whoops, um, well, that naturally molts off there, it is combed out in the spring. So let me back up just a little to say that here's Sai again, and this is his right hand um, uh, Kyrgyz um, employee, his sort of, uh, director of operations, and there they are on the ancient Silk Road. And then this is a, a slide showing those southern villages of where we work. The capital where Sai lives currently is way up here in Bishkek. And, and uh, he was when he started the project living down here in Osh, but this is the region that we're working in. And then uh, it used to be that before Soviet times, um, traditions over the centuries were that um, this natural fiber was combed out. And when it was combed, um, it leaves the goats with their outer coat to help keep them warm because the minute this fiber is combed out, those um, families that are gonna go up in the mountains and live in their yurts are, um, are leaving uh, for the summer. So um, it, what was happening uh, just a couple of years before uh, Sai started this endeavor was that 
um, uh, people were coming in and selling fiber middlemen actually were coming in purchasing from the shepherds paying very little um, they were shearing the goats leaving the goats um, without any uh, coat to um, battle the cold and so that is um, that is one of the concerns of cashmere production in recent history and Sai has really worked in this process to tackle those concerns and be ethical and sustainable in this um, in helping the shepherds with with their cashmere production. So we um, comb now, and these combs are made by uh, one of our families. And then this is the collection of the fiber, combing it off the goat. And you can see that is cashmere, not that outer coat. And they're collecting the fiber. They collect and separate uh, each animal's fiber into a specific bag so they can see how their goats are doing in terms of improving on quality based on the training that uh, they were eager to receive in, in sort of what is the optimal length of fiber and the fineness and how do you, you know, how do you breed with the goats that are that are giving that fiber. And boy, in just the first few years of this um, endeavor, it was very exciting for the team to go down and, and see the collections from the shepherds because they just could see improvement every year. And so this already wonderful, beautiful fiber just was, was um, reaching its potential. And then they, um, it really is a family affair. The young uh, teenagers often will meet the trucks to bicycle the fiber and uh, get paid for their um, fiber. We pay what is the current uh, market rate on the lowest quality fiber that is brought. And then we pay more than that to incentivize um, higher quality. And we really try to emphasize quality over quantity because we do not want to see this region uh, suffer um, 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 de desertification impacts like um, perhaps you've read about in China and Mongolia. And then we're weighing and measuring and paying for the quality of fiber and uh, doing the transactions. And there is Sai with his, um, with the, what has been purchased from one of the villages. We collect the fiber, we sort it, we, we use only the longest, most uniform length and, and the finest fiber that gets sent off for processing. We have a transparent um, processing chain, production chain, which is another one of the um, issues with um, um, cashmere in recent years is that we have no idea who is processing, where the where the cashmere is coming from and so again Sai addressed all of these issues um we have been uh scouring so that it has the cashmere then has to go through a process of being washed and then being dehaired which means you're taking out any of the outer hair that um was still um you know came along through the combing process it's only that downy undercoat that is um is cashmere and then we had a uh, spin and a dye in Great Britain currently. We did try to dye in Maine for a few years and, and then they went out of business. So we now dye in Scotland. And we have 16 beautiful colors. We dye on top of our natural, which is undyed and unbleached. It's just the blend of the, of the natural colors coming off the goats. And then we dye on top of, um, on top of that. So you get really earthy depth of colors. Um, and have 15 colors besides our natural. We have two weights of yarn, DK and fingering. Um, so that, that is a six ply and a three ply um, respectively. So what's happening currently in 2019, we had to take a little pause as a company. Um, there, we used the last commercial defairer in the Western world in England, and they have been in business for over 30 years and they want to retire. And if they retire, we are up a creek. We have no place to take our um, fiber to be repaired. So the project just falls apart. But this dehairer said from the outset, and this, this has been going on for a few years to try to make this happen, um, that he wanted to help get equipment into Kurdistan to start a dehairing facility there. What happened in 2019, though, was, was um, you know, that push becoming shove. So I needed to take action and develop that. Um, that dehairing facility, but he found that that which which makes perfect sense. Uh, he did not have the resources, both economic and time, to foster the yarn company, 
and the economic development in Kyrgyzstan at the same time. So we took a little pause, regrouped, and my husband and I invested in the arm portion so that we could work with Sly and continue um, continue trying to market and grow and build the arm company so that it could keep doing the work um, and uh, bring awareness to what's what this project is in Kyrgyzstan. And so here's Sly and his group. They're off in England getting some training with the D here, and this is our building in Bishkek, the capital. Um, and that was last year's fiber collection under the uh, the crazy uh, COVID spring. And they're just finishing up their purchasing for this year. Renovations of the building are gonna start. There have been so many, someone asked in one of our presentations that, that trying to imagine the obstacles of trying to do this kind of thing. And yes, there are many. The most recent is that as you all know, in this country, uh, building supplies have skyrocketed. So there, so their uh, their new um, um, estimate for rehabbing the building and bringing it to this uh, has just added another hundred thousand dollars. So, um, what a daunting task! And my admiration to Sai for just his tenacity to to keep going at this project. And my hope is that we can. Um, just make fans of the yarn so that we can keep going on our end. And um, what will happen then when they have the dehering facility is that they can sell then not just fiber for this yarn um, portion of the company, but also to other companies such as Burberry's who will then take the fiber and make their own yarn and make their own um, garments. So this will allow us to reintroduce the, the native goat to the rest of Kurdistan and uh, work with many more shepherds and uh, raise the income for those shepherds and make this truly a, um, a you know, Kurdistan on the map as a world-class producer of cashmere. So that is, in a nutshell, why we like to say that uh, it is much more than yarn. Um, so thankful. So I'll switch over and I want to talk more about the yarn. First, if you have any questions, and uh, my husband will give just a little update on what's happening. We've had some people join. Yep, um, we are a small group today. So um, what we like to do and what makes this more fun is if folks want to participate as we go, don't worry about <clears throat> unmuting. I uh, can generally see uh, when people turn their microphone on and uh, can stop uh, Amy and uh, take your questions that way. We'll also take questions through the chat. And um, I guess we'll start, are there any questions about the business and uh, sort of the, um, the social purpose and the, um, how things work in Kyrgyzstan or about uh, Kashmir in general? Well, we're, gonna get, um, we're gonna get to a little more about Kashmir and specifically our Kashmir. Um, because this is another amazing thing Sai has done in his production of cashmere is make sure that the cashmere is produced in a way that it, it will last. Um, so uh, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, to back up just a little bit, if you've joined us, the event page that is linked to our website um, is uh, the page that gives you access to the discount code. I, I also want you to know that if you have never received one of our color cards, first time order people or where we see we you've ordered before you um, we had these to uh, send out, we send you a color card so you have that. If you want that ahead of ordering, um, you can order for $5 and then you get a $5 coupon toward your order. Um, and then we offer free shipping for purchases $100 or more to Canada and uh, the US. So let's get back to this cashmere. It is, um, oh, and on that code, uh, the code is 10% off everything. You know what? Um, it's also kind of fun if people want to put into the chat, we know Annie is uh, down south of Mexico City. The other folks, if, if you want to just share where you're from, um, it's just kind of interesting to know how far spread out we all are. Yeah, that is interesting. And please, um, after I just tell a little bit about this cashmere and we look at these garments, feel free to unmute and what runs right what really makes these shows fun is um is uh the interaction so 
Okay, so this is that that raw cashmere coming right off the goat. And you, if you can see how kind of rough it is, uh, it's rough. Um, and then this is after it's been washed and goes through that dehearing equipment. And that is where you get that soft, downy, beautiful undercoat that is spun into our yarn. So the tradition of cashmere in North America for even since before the 80s has been to be um, a yarn that is produced to be very, very tactile, very, very, very soft to the touch. Think of that, you know, high-end department sweater, sweater, cashmere sweater that runs maybe $150. Um, but it doesn't last very long. And again, if we go back to the ethics of uh, cashmere production, um, the way that you get that um, cashmere to be that soft is that you prematurely bloom it. And that actually happens with a plant that has teasels. And they're um, either use the plant teasels, which are very sharp burrs, and machinery that uses that to just run the heck out of the fabric, or mechanical teasels that do the same thing. And um, we believe that cashmere should last a lifetime. Remember, I said it only four ounces come off a goat each year. It takes about six goats to get a sweater. It's a limited commodity. And um, the people who, I mean, we hope to bring honor to the people who are producing this. And um, I don't believe that cashmere that doesn't last does that. So um, what Cy has done is milled in the British tradition. This is our undyed, unbleached cashmere. And by doing that, um, we minimally process so that the blooming happens right after you wash the first time. And washing just means you finish your garment and then you slosh it in some tepid water and you, um, and I like to use a little shampoo because it's a protein fiber, just like our hair. And then you rinse it in that, you know, coolish tepid water, and then you just lay it to dry. And that's when you'll begin to see it bloom. When you knit with it though, here's, that was our fingering weight. This is our DK. This is Captain Pretty Jean's guy. It's gonna have a little bit of a different hand. It's gonna be very organic. But when you look at all of our garments, you'll see how even the stitches are. And that is because of both the, that we use the longest fibers, that the, the fiber itself coming out of Kyrgyzstan is very bouncy and lively, and that we mill in three and six ply, and that also gives a, a more rounded stitch. And then when you wash and you begin to bloom, it just fills in those stitches and makes them very even. That means that the drape is stunning, as well as the stitch definition. And then like we say, it is meant to last a lifetime. And so it also doesn't pill or, it, um, and when you see these garments, um, we've had them quite a while and none of them are pretty. Is there a question? Oh, no. We've got folks from uh, Pennsylvania, north of Toronto, Mexico, and uh, Leah is a spinner we as well as a knitter. So let's make sure that we, sometimes we don't uh, we remember to show things, this. But, um, we, we, we sell the fiber. Uh, if you if you're so inclined, um, and there is an article on our uh, attached to our media that was in spinoff a few years ago, and what you get is two ounces of fiber, so four of these bundles in a box. What is the cable length of cashmere? I've never worked with it. I'm sorry, say that again. How long is the fiber? The staple length of the fiber. Um, the staple length is. Uh oh, I'm going to forget the specs. Uh, is it on the website? It's I very, remember we're, it's very <laughs> similar to cotton, like the best Egyptian cotton. It's okay. very similar to that. Yeah, it's a short fiber, and I'm forgetting the exact number where we are right now. Um, I'm remembering the diameter, which is right around 15, 16. Okay. Um, but I definitely can um, I'll put that on our event page, and then you can go back there and look. Thank you. And, thank you. and I hope I pronounced your name right. You did. <laughs> Thank so you. let's, and you can, if more things occur to you um, about the cashmere itself and working with the cashmere, we're going to go start with my sister and we're going to talk about um, the knit samples and uh, just any of those questions that just feel free to pipe in or type your question. While we're on the subject of the, the, the yarn, um, how do you wash it? And I did it, wash it. And you did washing and did you do uh, allergies? Yep. Yeah. So um, uh, most people are not allergic to cashmere if, if they have trouble with wool. The fiber strand on wool has some, a bunch of barbs, which is what also makes it felt beautifully. And um, 
cashmere is like, if you think about it, just a rod. A rod. So you don't have that irritation. And then uh, wool produces lanolin, and there is no lanolin uh, from the goats for this, which lanolin can be the allergen producer. So off of ca cashmere is something that people can use when they can't use wool. So Sig, welcome. This, if you weren't with us earlier, this is my sister Sigmi, and she has knit so many things for me. And uh, she lives in Kirkland, Ontario, Canada. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No. no, I think you said hello, but I was talking, so I wanted to just stop talking. That. Looks like you, it's beautiful there again in Kitchener. Oh, perfect day. Perfect day. Yes. Perfect. We have humidity. That is just ridiculous. But we don't. At least we've had rain. Many people are just very dry, so I will, I will not be unthankful. Well, what are you guys going to talk about first? Okay, let's talk about this one. This is our new feature. Um, Brand new pattern by one of our designers, Taylor Harris, and it is uh, called Brookside, and it is a poncho um, that is um, stockinette, well, actually with a ribbing, so one stitch ribbing stockinette. Um, can I say those two together? I guess it's, it's, it's ribbing. Um, and then you have the striping. And when you see that we have these offerings of kits where there are partial skeins, you get to choose the colors. We're doing that to try to give a way to use color in, in snippets and not have you have to buy the whole skein. So that's uh, the philosophy about behind some of these skip, kits. Um, this particular um, color work that Taylor did, she used our natural as the background and scarlet, stone crop, curry, and espresso but you are able to uh, choose your own colors. And so Sig's gonna tell us a little bit about this knit. She hasn't made the piece, but she's made several swatches so she knows about the, um, which you can see is a really, a really easy knit. It is, it's knit in a square. Uh, and then you put a little shoulder seam to uh, wear it at, a, at, a, um, at an angle. The, the, the stitches, uh, you can sit in front of the TV and knit. It's a very easy stitch. It's same front and back, except, you know, you switch purl and knit around. Um, and you measure how far you've gone with the base color and then add the, um, the rows of color. Very, yeah. very easy, very easy knit. What about the edges? Stunning. Yeah, the edges have a beautiful, um, uh, slip stitch. So they're, in fact, when you see the slant seam, it's just a beautiful seam in the, just incorporating those slip stitches. So, but it makes just a beautiful edge. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Taylor, Taylor wanted to show off the, the color and texture and the drape of the yarn. So this is what she did. Why don't you take a spin? Take a spin. I just <laughs> wore this last night. We went to see a movie for the first time and I wore this in the movie theater and it was perfect. So I had just a short sleeve shirt on and this, and it was perfect. So this is a year round item and um, yeah. So that one is the natural as the background color. I, I have done some knitting with the indigo as the background color and there's another knitter um, using the slate as the background color. So I think soon Amy will have posted some of those different options for you to see. Um, yeah. So if you're working on your yeah. visual, so it's hard to imagine the colors without kind of seeing them. And if anyone wants to uh, stop us at any time while we're looking at a particular garment that has color work and ask and have us hold up skeins of different colors, uh, please put that in the chat or we have a small group, so just unmute. Yeah, I'm happy that it's fun to put colors together so you can see. Um, so this one, talk about this one, Sydney. This is a favorite. Are you muted? Nope. Lost you. Oh. Oh, you you froze, but you're back. Okay. Is she back? Yeah. Oh. Talk about this it's, one, Zach. Sorry. Yes, it says my internet connection is unstable. I'm outside, but it should be fine. This. Did you say the name of it? Nope. The Sandwaves Poncho. This is a Sandwaves Poncho by Noragon, and um, it is. It, you can't. I mean, you can knit it in front of the TV, uh, 
once you've got the two stitches memorized, it's just, or two rows, it's deceptively simple. It is two, two different rows. Once you cast on, two different rows that you're alternating. Uh, lace on both sides. And then every 14 rows or so, you do an 18 stitch cable. But your stitches stay the same. You don't change your stitch pattern. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, effect from those cable stitches that gives it that wavy look. I just, I just love it. You can um, put button. It's, it's um, closed with buttons and buttonholes, and the buttonholes are self-made from the cable hole. And uh, it doesn't say on the pattern, but we suggest that you whip stitch over and around that hole to stabilize it. And um, especially the top holes, because they, uh, it's just that it one stressed. stitch that's crossed and it can pull. So, so we've done that on ours and have had no trouble at all. But this has been a very popular, very beautiful, every time I wear it, if any of you know, um, uh, Kate Atherley, she's a Canadian designer and teacher. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be in a class with her and she, she noticed it immediately and wondered who had done it. And we talked about it for quite a while. So yeah, it even catches the eye of other designers. <laughs> and people on the street. Yeah, when I'm out with uh, with these two, Signe, of course, is my sister-in-law, and uh, one of them, or they both have them on, uh, we often get stopped. So this is a juice guy, and it's six pounds of uh, fingering weight. Um, Comes in a kit as well. And the kits are price point to bundle together to give you a little bit of a price break, break because there are more stains, and then that is 10% off uh, through tomorrow. Uh, any questions? And it is the Sandwaves Poncho. It's by Nora Gon. So then let's move on to our vest. This is our vest um, by Paula Ferreira. And uh, this is another favorite. So Sig has made this as well for our mother. Um, talk about this one. This is a back and forth knit with um, two lace panels in the front and stock and net in the back. The lace panels are identical. Uh, so you, um, I actually just used one lace chart, the one lace chart. It has a 14 stitch um, edging, again, with that two stitch slip stitch edge uh, that just, that um, Taylor used on the poncho that is, makes just such a beautiful edge. You can uh, see there's a twisted knit stitch in there so that it actually defines that um, that ribbing with the twisted knit stitch. You split uh, under the arms and add stitches for the sleeves and you just keep knitting up the side and knitting up the back. Um, you attach the ribbing at the back and then you um, stitch it all together across the, sh the shoulders. It's, it's a very relaxing nice knit if this is in dk i am wasn't a dk person um i like i like lace actually um and this um fingering is a is a, a light fingering and uh i loved knitting in the dk it's such a beautiful beautiful organic yarn um, yeah I and, and i love it when the pattern pops out at you because of the stitch definition yeah. it absolutely does this in this vest yeah um what's the color you're wearing this is in our silver fox and we have uh three sizes we have i do put a tech editor we're adding another size that will will take it up to the the high 50 bust and 62 up to 62 bust but it has a lot of ease as well so um and we we've, we've had a couple of shows people have asked questions about making it longer um, yeah and you simply just simply just measure how long you want it before you start where the sleeves are it's, yeah, it's the pattern doesn't change there's no shaping um it's straight stitching straight knitting so you can add length for sure um, so then uh, Norgon has another beautiful pattern for us. She has a few here. We won't get to them all, but the, uh, the Chermock sweater, which is the in curry on the mannequin. Um, and here it is in our sea glass. Fingering weight, 
Uh, it runs size 30 to size um, 50 right now. Again, this is also at the tech editor to get it up to size 62, but size 30 and 34 take four stains and then size 50 takes seven. And again, in kits, um, and uh, Signe has made this as well. In fact, she made this exact one. I made that one. So, so tell us about this. So this is knit in the round, uh, although you cast on um, and knit back and forth. And then when you attach it, there's this little um, overlap at the bottom, which, which is a beautiful design feature. It actually shows up in the sweater because it's, it it's a stocking net, yeah. There's a little bit of shaping that's done by increasing and decreasing. So that's easy to play with if you don't want it there, but it actually, the sweater looks beautiful on all the bodies I've seen it on. Mm -hmm. um, We've had it made in several sizes and seen it seen it on people of all sizes and shapes. And it is, it is it's really very flattering. Yeah. Designed. If you want to bring that closer again, I have you spotlight now. Sleeves are back and sleeves are back and forth, and then they're attached so that you knit it up, up as a raglan sleeve. Um, and I always caution people: my 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 back and forth is a different gauge than my in the round, so you need to kind of pay attention to that. Although sometimes it doesn't matter on the sleeve so much. Um, beautiful um, rolled edges at the bottom and the top, and that. That yoke is simply decreasing um, in, a, in, in that pattern all the way up to the top. And then part of the beauty of this design is that when you do a yoke, it, gives, it increases your fabric, or since it's going the bottom, bottom up, you're, you're decreasing your fabric, but you get a bulk of fabric right in here. And then to counter that, if you, which Nora Vaughn did, because she's an amazing designer, if you do a raglan sleeve, which in this yarn, you just barely can tell this is a raglan sleeve, but that yeah. reduces then that fabric. And then her shaping, she just knows a woman's body and she has the shaping perfect. So we love this one. Um, check this one out. It's called Termok. Uh, Ron can type that in, but T-U-R-M-O-K. Any questions, any colors you wanna see, any, feel free. Um, we do have a sweater. Let's see how's our time coming. We have uh, 12 minutes. Why don't we do, it's a minute long, but why don't we feature, there's a sweater on our website called Rihanna, brand new. Um, Sydney is in the process of making our sample. Our designer, Shelly, has her uh, sample with her in the studio. And so I have a quick little video. She couldn't be with us today, but I have a quick little video we recorded this week of, um, of her talking about Rihanna. And so we'll put that on full screen and there you go. It's just a minute long. Oh, Yana, right here. Uh, I apologize for the low light. Uh, hopefully you can see it. Um, the inspiration for this piece was the beautiful fabric that Jim Cashmere creates. I mean, it is, it's, it's so hard to describe. You just really have to feel it. Um, but I wanted to create a very classic, over for myself. So this was a very selfish piece. Um, I created this piece. <laughs> I created this piece for myself. Um, it's a um, elbow length sleeve, but I've also written the pattern for a full length sleeve. So it's up to you what you want to make. Um, very classic print. Um, some of the uh, techniques used are my Favorite cast on for ribbing, the one by one rib is the waist yarn to do a cast on. And it's a beautifully rounded edge. And you get in the round from the bottom up, you divide it the armholes and work the uh, the upper part flat from front and back. You shape the shoulders using German short rows and uh, three needle bind off from the seam and it's a beautiful flat seam. Uh, the collar is then picked up, or the neck edge is picked up and finished with a tubular bind off. And then the sleeves are picked up uh, around the armhole edge and worked down um, so that you can really gauge the length of the sleeve right on as you go. And then it's also finished with the ribbing and the tubular bind off. And is that seen under the arm, or is it done in the round, the sleeve? The sleeve is done in the round, so there's no seam. Oh. Yeah, so it's worked in the round. 
from the bolt. So um, again, any questions about that? Um, Sig can show quickly her, her, she's working it up in the black cherry. And this. I have about 10 inches of it. Here's the, the ribbing with that tubular cast on, which makes just a beautiful continuous edge that isn't pulled in at all by cast on stitches. So I'm about ready to um, divide it to start the front and the back and then add the sleeves. And that's and that's kind of a, an example. I don't know how well you can see there because I can't see the monitor, but um, you know, when you're knitting with the yarn, um, what it's like and then uh, and then you get that bloom to happen when you wash. Um, there's another, so um, I'm working in a little design team with um, Shelly Anderson, so you just saw her, and she, if you are familiar with her work, she was the designer for Shibui for several years and then wanted to go out on her own, and we got connected, and she is mentoring currently Taylor and myself, and our goal is to, we have some mini collections for each of us. Uh, Taylor is a more seasoned, she's been at design for a couple of years. I'm brand new, but we're um, trying to lay the foundation and um, then create a program where we can mentor other, other designers. So we're very excited about that. We're not ready yet, but that is what our purpose is for that. This is another design that she's done. And again, there are many more coming, um, but this is a great, like this could be summer or, well, first you can do that you know, wonderful thing around your neck, which we love all summer, or and all winter, fall, winter. Um, but you can also wear this uh, just, you know, again, like I said, to the movie theater or a cool night or, you know, in air conditioning. This is called Vibe. It's three skeins of yarn, again, in a kit. Um, and you get the pattern and you have, it's done here in a, uh, slate, mulberry, and stone crop. And she's done this nice chevron and then stockinette and just a beautiful piece. This is full skeins of yarn because um, she's used the colors evenly. Any questions? Anything anybody wants to clarify or see or? Um, I'll show you my first uh, design is again in fingering weight, and it is a fingerless mitt called Sparrow. I've done it in um, Silver Fox with natural as the um, mosaic color work. You switch the colors at the beginning of the row and then it's slip stitches that, that make the color work. But what that means is we don't waste the yarn, which is important, and um, you don't get those floats underneath. It's all, it is all, um, interconnected knitting so there are no floats to grab on anything like rings and you get a skein and a half you get to choose your colors and a skein and a half should give you enough to actually make two pairs so that is called Sparrow. Um, we have some color work that has been done um, this has been a great uh, do you have a question uh, what color is the skein that is the sixth from the left this is our scarlet. So how is that coming on the screen? Uh, the closer it is, it looks a little too bright. But if you so, look at it um, on the table, how's uh, that? the way the lighting is today, yeah, that's pretty good. It really, I mean, it's really like that um, flower. And Leah, did we get the right one? She's unmuted, so go ahead and talk to us. Yes, that's the right one. Yeah, because it because I didn't see. Yeah, it, it's funny. It reads different when it's laying down on the table than when she. Oh, yeah, the light, the way the lights mean that. And so yeah. that you know the color card is great. Uh, if you want that scent first, that's great. Um, there are also many, but it's a beautiful, beautiful true red. Um, and so that true red has that blue undertone to it. But yeah, that geranium is. Now, I don't know what would happen if we brought it up. I don't know. Does it wash it up? Yeah, it's still kind of washed out, but it's- uh, it, looks, it looks too orange. It's it's a true blue-red. It's yeah. just that beautiful, rich yeah. red scarlet. Yeah, so if, you, if it's, is it better back here? It is. Yeah, yeah, so this is what that's like. This is a wonderful pattern. This is tumbling blocks. This was but done by um, uh, Lisa Hoffman. And the beauty of this pattern, 
besides being beautiful, it, it's lace and then little short rows that alternate, you know, from one side. Here's a little short row, but then on the other side, the, the fat loops over here. So you get that really organic edge. Um, it's beautiful. And then the beautiful, or the, I think the great part of the pattern is that it has one, two, and three skein verges, versions. So um, the three skein and then the two skein, this really gives you an idea of what you get out of our fingering weight, which is 50 grams and 308 yards. And then one skein gives you just a great little, little um, scarf as well. So that's called tumbling block. Why don't you go ahead and tell us um, on our DK, uh, what is the spec of this game? So you get 150 yards on uh, the DK. And what you can do with one skein of that is this is our Naryn hat, N-A-R-Y-N. And so oops, the this pattern also has two versions. Uh, the version that gives you one skein is this guy. Um, so this is a this is a great hat. This is in our slate. And then if you want to get another skein, um, you can do the striping in the pom pom. A lot of uh, a lot of guys, one of my best friends and Amy's uh, best friend here in Ohio, yeah. uh, he uh, he loves this. It, it, he's now got three. He keeps asking his wife to, to knit a different color. Well, he has one of these, but then she's done some other designs for him and out of fingering and, and he wears them all the time. He was so funny the other night we were out for dinner and he said, I think wearing that June cashmere hat, any of them, is better than like not having anything in my head. And that's, he was saying that about all seasons and it was kind of funny. I'm like, goodness, I need you on a commercial. And then you also get um, out of one skein of DK, which again is 150 yards, a pair of fingerless mitts. So um, this is in our Aegean. This is the lattice mitt. This was designed by Mary Lou Egan. And then a real favorite has been our journey mitts. Um, and this is a little longer, you can make them shorter, but and um, has a nice little cable on the front. Again, uh, one skein. This is our mulberry color journey mitts. And uh, yeah. We have, uh two minutes left and you know one thing I'm, I want to say is that um, many of these samples have been all over the world to shows and shops uh, pre-pandemic when we were doing a lot more uh, wholesale and um, Amy's uh, the Nora Gone poncho she's worn that steadily for what two and a half years yes and it just looks like it did the first time I saw it yeah so I, I, when I, and Sig will attest to this, and other people have commented that um, they just, when you, when you understand that we have been accustomed to a cashmere that is very different from this, and then, so we've learned that we really need to set your expectation because it is different, but it is meant to last. This is how cashmere is, um, is for the markets like Europe and around the world. That this is what their cashmere, what they know cashmere to be, and it it is amazing to work with. We had uh, a few people join halfway through, and yes. one question is: Can you just hit the washing one more time? Yes. So I'm going to hit two things. One is if you join later, we did the, our hour as a, a full continuous hour. So in the first half of the hour. Um, I shared photos and told about our story in Kyrgyzstan. And then last half, we talked about our yarn and our garments. And, uh, and I'm gonna put this the minute our show is over, we've recorded it, and I'm gonna put the link on the event page. So you can go back and watch any portion of this. But I do encourage you to watch, if you didn't see it, the portion about um, what this, why this yarn exists. Um, and then uh, washing is, I just wash, and we, I think we have it on the label. Uh, yes, we do. So you um, just gently wash, hand wash. I you like to use shampoo because a gentle shampoo because it's a protein fiber like our hair. And I slosh in tepid water um, and then I rinse it, maybe let it sit in the rinse a little bit. When I go to squeeze it, I roll it with a towel, I lay it flat to dry. I'm not a big blocker, um, but things like 
the wonderful archer shawl in the back where you might want to pull the points out. That's maybe when you want to block uh, seriously with the pins. And you know, we still have seven folks with us. Uh, you want to cheat? It's just now 12 and show the archer real quick. Sure, I wanted to show this one too. Oh, okay. um, this one has been a favorite cowl, and my sister also knit this, <laughs> and she knit it in a solid color so that you can really. It was beautiful that way too. She knit it in our curry, and my mother has a beautiful purple. Um, Who did this? Winter coat. That one was done by um, a, a sample knitter. Um, but these are our colors. This is called um, the Three Color Cashmere Cowl by um, Hoki Locatelli. And so this has been a favorite pattern. It's on Ravelry. It's her pattern. We don't have it on our website. Um, but it takes three skeins, three colors, and the colors in this sample are espresso, natural, and pumpkin. But my sister made it for my mother. She did it in solid curry, and you could see all those stitches beautifully because my mother had a, a plum, just about this color, a wool coat. And so imagine this as the scarf. It was just stunning. Thank you for the kind words, uh, Leah, Mary, and um, Annie. And I think we're we're getting people dropping, so I guess we'll hit the Archer Shawl next time. <laughs> yeah. So any questions? I'm available by email, Amy at JuneCashmere.com, and um, yeah. So I'll be putting this recording on our site. And thank you so much. Take care, everybody. <laughs>